Good afternoon. Uh, I'm obviously very happy to be here, to be back here, and, and to, uh, to have the opportunity to meet uh, the newcomer and member of the very fast-growing manufacturing in the age of experience community. Um, Mr. Hay, very interesting talk. I mean, it, it did demonstrate the way that the digital world can support massive change in industries. And, and indeed, we, uh, we do need massive change because we are entering in the age of experience. And in the age of experience, a manufacturer needs to deliver extremely complex product, extremely fast, much, much faster uh, than ever before. And that puts a lot of stresses on, on all of us industrial. I've been visiting a lot of operations lately, and, and uh, I can tell you, uh, this, this change is, op is upon us, and, and it's, it's, if anything, it's happened faster than we ever thought. And the issue with that is that, uh, and we heard about uh, Weiwei and, and others, uh, th those are front runners that are already started to adapt to this new situation, and obviously those who do not move are at risk. So we need to go forward. Um, and, and, and change some of those uh, major uh, models that we've been used to, to, to use in the past, mass, uh, mass production models, diversification models, those do not perform to the level to which we expect it tomorrow in the age of experience. Let me, uh, let me elaborate a little bit. In year 2000, uh, uh, gl globally at that point in time, um, the, the economy became really worldwide. And as it became worldwide, uh, the, the market for industrial goods exploded. As a lot of newcomers, China, India, Russia, came into the game. At this point in time, the name of the game was to be able to provide product to all those new customers. Product at a reasonable cost to start with, and, and product also at an adequate uh, level of quality. Um, we entered an era of uh, market push as volume was of the essence. And so manufacturers adapted themselves, and what they did is that they started building to stock, um, very standard product, in usually fairly massive but extremely stable organization. Um, obviously, one of the questions was how to get the machine going and the supply, and so the notion of supply chain emerged, some kind of hierarchical notions of descending flow of information, ascending flows of supply, to, uh, to feed the machines. Product introduction was not really an issue then because, because the market was not necessarily required a lot of new products. And therefore, at that time, the classical try and error approach was the one that was followed by most of the industry in order to, to introduce new product on a rare occasion. That was in year 2000. Around 2010, 10 years later, things changed slightly because after having pur purchased uh, for 10 years very worldwide standard product, we, customer, the market, required product which was a little bit more suited to the local or specific needs. Um, in, in, uh, the, uh, the, customer, the, the product sorry, started to become configurable. And, and with the product came a set of services to further enhance the value of the product and its usage. And, and obviously, uh, manufacturing here again had to adapt because uh, as uh, the, the, the market switch from market uh, push to market pull, uh, and as the subcategories of customers uh, just increased, not only did the product getting more and more complex, got more and more complex, but the need for speed in introduction of new products was, was rising very significantly. So at that point in time, uh, three things happened. First, uh, obviously the try and error approach was not appropriate at all to try to feed the market with new product. And so, uh, this was at the time that emerged the notion of virtual twin, which was a digital sandbox which allowed engineering to converge on the project definition much, much faster than ever before, and hence enhancing the speed of the product introduction. Second, uh, we had to look again about the supply chain, because supply chain, this hierarchical ascending, descending flows, uh, was not agile enough in order to feed those uh, new products coming in the market. And so at that point in time, uh, the idea was, first of all, to have all the actors around the product involved in the famous supply chain, which, uh, and, and, and that would include the service people, as a, the, the, the person that, or the, the organization that provided service to enhance the, uh, the functionality of the product, 
and, and, uh, and to have that set of organization managed in a much more horizontal and synchronized way. This was the emergence of what was called at the time the value, uh, the value chain. And that provided some effect and indeed some speed. And finally, manufacturers also needed to improve. And so they started building to orders and not to stock. And, uh, and they had to find ways to be more uh, reactive in the workshop. And this is at the time where they tried to synchronize business processes within the workshop, flow of parts and flow of information in order to be more efficient. And that, again, was, was, uh, was a very good uh, way forward. And they did indeed meet the challenge of the year 2010. Is that sufficient today? The answer is no, because we don't want to buy products. We want to have experiences. And the experience is to be able to choose our product, to use our product in our own way, in our own usage. And obviously, preset configurations of products and services do not match the diversity or creativity we all have as users. So we need to do something else. We need to adapt again to be way, way more adaptive. Um, the first thing is uh, we have to reinvent the way we construct this partnership or this supply chain or the value network or the value chain, I would say, uh, around the product. Why? Because we need to be able to, on the fly, on the, uh, instantaneously, being to adapt this provider of services to the usage the, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the customer wants to do. And hence, we have to completely change the value chain. The value chain is not efficient enough. We have to come to this very adaptive system, which will allow to build value chain, but on the fly for each customer at each point in time. This is a notion of value network, which is today pushing extremely strongly the age of experience, or at least the capability to feed the market with highly customized product. The second thing is, obviously, to be part of the value network, manufacturers also need to adapt. First, they don't need to build to order now. They need to build to my order, which is something totally different. And second, they cannot, they cannot accept to be just reactive. They need to be adaptative. And to be adaptative, what does it mean? It means that at any point in time, they need to be able to entertain a series of possible options for the future. New, new options of productions, new options of product, new options of supply base. And obviously, this cannot be done in the Excel file of year 2000. And I would say this cannot even be done with the virtual twin of year 2010, because the virtual twin was built to help the design converge faster, not to explore future. So we have to go to the next gen. And the next gen, this is the 3D experience twin, a holistic, model-based, data-driven twin of reality, which, which models will allow us to explore future based on real-time data. This is the way we will be able to explore the different options that we have. And this is the way we will be able to pick that option that fits our purpose. So this is the way forward. This is the path to excellence. And, and we should not wait, because this is available today. And again, the front runners are moving ahead and you know, totally changing the market. We need to be with them. And so let's, let, let all, all of us uh, go together along that path and build uh, this uh, virtual digit, uh, 3D experience twin based on the 3D experience platform for all your companies. As demonstration is usually much, much better than a lot of slides, uh, and to further demonstrate to you the value of that approach to answer the challenges of the age of experience, what we've done today for you, and actually for the couple of days that we are all together, is we actually have built a 3D experience twin for you so that you can experience it and see the value that it can provide. So in the minute to come, uh, let, let us just go and visit that uh, 3D experience twin and see uh, how, how you can leverage it to get the speed and agility that the market requires. So to do that demo, what I would like to do is, is call on stage my colleague that helps help out building that 3D experience twin and so that we, we can guide you in, in, this, uh, in this virtual tour, I would say. So, I call on stage uh, Morgan Zimmerman, CEO of Exalid, Rob van Egmont, CEO of Quintic, and Gals Coleman, VP Marketing of Enovia. Okay. So here we are. This is the 3D experience platform. Uh, and this is a view 
of the 3D experience twin we have built for you. So as, uh, as always, with, with visiting a workshop, I suggest we take a little tour of the operation here. Okay? So here is the uh, warehouse. Okay? This is where the inbound logistic is coming. From here, the flow of materials goes to the fabrication here um, for mostly machining and milling. Uh, but also in fabrication, you see that that site just got, got equipped with a 3D printing facility to put some agility in the system. So the part from the warehouse goes to those two fabrication areas, and then the flow of materials goes to here, which is the painting or surface preparation in order to get uh, the materials prepared for final assembly. The final assembly will happen here. This is the big assembly hall uh, where the excavators that should have started like this uh, because this is an excavator factory, uh, the excavator will be uh, actually assembled. When assembled, uh, all excavators will go into that big hole over there, the demo hole, in which uh, customer acceptance will be performed for those small series which requires it and when, when customer wants to see it, or in any case, uh, it will go there for preparation uh, to transport. Uh, you see, this is a sustainable site, and so... Uh, and so this site has uh, uh, wind turbines, which produces electricity for, um, for the sites. And so, uh, indeed, this is, uh, this is very good from a sustainable point of view. Um, and finally, uh, have a look at here. This is uh, the engineering and the management building. And in here is, is kind of the nervous center uh, of, of, uh, of that site where a lot of decisions um, are taken. So, I, sug I suggest uh, we start the tour. Um, and uh, to start with, in, in, in the introduction, I mentioned the fact that uh, the 3D experience twin was uh, data driven. Morgan, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the f and why uh, data plus sm smart manufacturing will? indeed enhance performance and agility of this operation? Of course. But let's first go um, into our ballroom. Uh, you're talking about performance for the avoidance of any loot. When you talk about performance, you're talking both about the performance of the operation and execution, as well as the performance of uh, the plant itself, uh, every machine, every robot, every resources. To achieve that, which is what you see now on the screen, We've made two breakthroughs. The first breakthrough is a technology breakthrough. We've built in all of the capabilities to manage the semantic of the product to be manufactured, to manage the MES data, and to manage at the same time all of the machine data, the whole of that in the same system. So in other words here, you're controlling IoT, relationship, semantic, all together. The second is more interesting. It's not technology. It's managerial. It's organizational. Analytics is not for executive. Not only for executive. Indeed, analytics is for everyone in the company. Because what we want is we want to make sure that everyone is empowered to drive their everyday decision. But to do that, we need to give them the context. We need to guide them to make sure that when they're taking their decision, they understand the impact. And they're making sure that their decisions are geared towards enterprise performance drivers. So connecting performance with every decision. Morgan, in, in you, you just mentioned very briefly IoT. I'm, I'm a little surprised because uh, in some other context, I mean, analysts are spending you know, full session totally dedicated on IoT. So aren't we a little bit underplaying that? Uh, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, indeed. You're talking about performance. Performance requires availability of every system. If you want availability of every system, you need to control what's happening in real time. Uh, here, more specifically, uh, we are controlling the real-time data uh, of our wind turbine. And you've just seen that one has changed status. So of course, uh, I can go and see. We see uh, connectors to the OSI soft data, the real-time data. However, this is very, very far from being enough. Because in reality, if you take the IoT data alone, there is not much you can do. There is not much insight you can get. So at Dassault System, we believe, and we have the very strong belief that IoT is a must, but under two conditions. Condition number one is we're using what we're learning on the virtual world to better interpret 
the IoT feeds. So there is no other way to get inside than to be capable of understanding how the, uh, the system is behaving against the way it should have been behaving. This is how you get insights. This is how you identify weak signal. The second condition is that you actually project as well in the virtual world the whole of the context. What was the maintenance operation? What is the spares which are applicable? What is the nominal purpose for this specific system? So if you have both the context and if you learn from the virtual world, then IoT becomes of great value. I, I, think, I really think you have a point here. I think you know, one of the big differentiators of our approach is indeed the fact of being able to look at data in context. I mean, but I think this needs a little bit deepening. Yeah. I can give you more insight on what I mean by context, and I realize I've been using the word a lot, and I'll continue to do that. But this is easy for me uh, in your specific context, Guillaume. You have spent far too much time yourself uh, in the factory to accept that people on the shop floor would agree to work just on a dashboard. Because if you want to give them context, you need to give them more context. So what you see now is a virtual representation of our factory with all of the real-time data fully projected uh, here. So you have all of the performance KPI, you have all of the issues, you have all of the behavior. Everything is accessible from the virtual world. The good news is here you have all of the context. There is no more need to provide everyone with the name of the robot to make sure you speak about the same machine. It's obvious. It's in front of your eyes. And by the way, there is an interesting side effect to that. Because this is model-based, and because on top of our data science engine, we have a science engine with modeling and simulation, here we can play what-if scenarios to make sure we're configuring the system to behave the way we want and to model our future. To the point. So if I understand well, here I'm going to manage my old data, right? So I'm going to be the king in my own castle within the four walls of my factory. But as industrial, we all know that this is not quite sufficient. We need to get open to the outside, and, and we need to get that data flowing in. How do we do that? Yeah. I hope that I have not been misleading so far. Uh, it is true that in the last few minutes, I have mostly been showing you data that are coming from within the factory. But you're right. Smart manufacturing requires stuff outside of the factory. And more specifically, start by capturing the data generated by the customers themselves. So what you now see on the screens are actually data uh, generated by the customer on our excavators. So this is quality data, this is warranty data. And we've put lots of semantic to be able to match the specific issues to specific pieces of equipment uh, of our excavators. But you know what is complex? The co what is complex is to connect the dots. To connect the dots between an issue and machine data. To connect the dots between MES and these issues. And to do that, we've made another breakthrough. We're using technology that was initially developed for cyber criminality to connect the dots, which is what you see on the screen now. So here, this is where the analyst can build his knowledge graph, look at the incidents, connect the dots between all of the data. And while doing that, not only is solving his problem quicker, but at the same time, he's building a knowledge network. This is a capitalization system to make sure that this problem never happen again, one. And should that problem ever happen, that you get an alert immediately. So if I summarize what we did show in the last few minutes, we did show how we're managing end-to-end -end performance from execution to plant performance. We did show how we're using performance drivers and analytics to empower everyone in the factory, everyone in the shop floor, to make sure that every local decision is made geared uh, toward performance. We did show how we're using IoT in our unique manner in the virtual world to get better insights. We did show how we're factoring into it all of the customer experience data. And then, of course, how we're using our science engine to model our future. The whole of that with a deep graph, a knowledge network to do investigation. Thank you, Morgan. I think it's clear. It's clear that, uh, indeed, uh, we can uh, leverage the 3D experience win to be able to take or to do smart decision making and obviously, you know, get into the level of performance that we need. Thank you. Um, other aspects of things, uh, obviously, is around value. So, uh, so Rob, 
you know, how, how, how can we leverage the 3D experience wheel twin to capture and manage value? Okay. Thank you, Guillaume. I think w just to remind you, all of this data is very important because it drives great decision-making processes. And I think if you want to look at investigating where does value come from in the manufacturing experience, we need to look at where do we actually make the right decisions to deliver that. And, and one of those areas is actually in uh, sales and operational planning, or SNOP. In SNOP, we actually m manage the demand from our customers versus our ability to supply, and then make strategic decisions as to what demand we want to fulfill and what we may need to do to actually fulfill some of that demand. So we may have to look into our supply capabilities. So let me give you a little bit of an example of how that may work. So here you see the SNOP solution as it runs on the 3D experience platform. You can see that uh, we are not necessarily fully making our revenue budget. Uh, because right now some of our sales forecasts seem to be low. So we do a collaborative forecasting methodology which is partly driven by algorithms on the platform but also partly driven by sales and marketing information. And as part of that collaborative discussion we find out that yes indeed uh, our sales forecasts are right now s s on the low side. So let's together with all of our stakeholders increase our sales forecasts for about 30% so that at least we have a collaborative, uh, let's say, concession based on uh, a consensus, sorry, based consensus on, on where our demand is going. So now we all know where, uh, where the demand is coming from. And now, of course, the next thing we need to do is figure out, can we actually supply? And again, as part of the uh, uh, sales and operational planning module of the 3D experience platform, we've completely modeled our complete supply chain with all of our factories here, two in Europe, in the US, and in Asia so that we can precisely detail out how we're going to actually manufacture the, uh, our excavators so that we can deliver that supply. And then we can figure out, are we able to fulfill all of our sales needs? And again, you can see here through the chart that we have a challenge actually living up to that expectation. So we have a bigger demand coming from our customers than we are currently able to supply through our, uh, our, our manufacturing capabilities. So let's dig deep a little bit into how do we actually build up the, uh, the, the excavators and, and where do we produce them? And then you can see here that we find out that right now we're short on capacity to build cabins. And, and given the larger demand in cabin-based excavators, you can understand that if we don't have the cabins, we basically can't create the total excavators. So now we need to start doing some what-if analysis to figure out how can we address this shortage of capacity. Because, of course, in the end, we want to fill our demand. So we can look into, for instance, extending some of the uh, manufacturing capabilities. We may be able to outsource some of the manufacturing, introduce 3D printing, and all of that will lead to multiple scenarios that we then hand over to an, uh, an executive SNOP process where we can actually make a decision to go for the most profitable, in this case, scenario. And then we've made the decision where to produce what, how to produce it, and we can hand that over to further scheduling. All right, so yet another way to, uh, to explore futures. Okay, so that's clear about the way we're going to manage our own capability to produce, and, and we know what to produce and for whom. But obviously, we have to get the supply base somewhere in the picture, right? Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so on the one hand, of course, we are looking at combining and looking at the demand from our customers, our ability to supply. But of course, that's not only it. We also need to look at our ability for our suppliers to, de to deliver the parts. Right? And, and earlier we talked about manufacturing being moving from a uh, silo effect to an integrated effect. And I think we need to be aware here that the integration effect of manufacturing does not only contain within the factory walls, but actually it got, got extended. So as part of the 3D experience platform, we've actually made a number of unique capabilities available to actually create a full value network with, between us and our suppliers to make sure that we have a fully integrated set. Some of these features include a full catalog of all different components that our suppliers might provide us. And let me give you a number, 100 million. Actually, we have 100 million different parts in our system available for our cu customers. And it's maybe another compo important component is actually program-driven. That means that for every individual program you build, you can select which uh, supplies you want to use and which, of course, you cannot use. A third one is, and as you can see that here, is that it's actually integrated into the authoring tools. So as the designer is work working on the design and he comes up to a specific part that he would like to use, immediately he gets in a contextual view of what he actually has available, which part have been authorized for availability, and which are there right now. 
And as such, we create, let's say, a secure network where we can produce in a lean and, let's say, collaborative way together with our suppliers a full, uh, let's say, a network of providing value to our customers. But now, let's imagine we can go even one step further. Let's imagine that on the 3D experience platform, we have a marketplace where you can actually uh, let's say order, pay, and get your parts immediately delivered from those suppliers in your value network. That would immediately make that whole configuration uh, of that uh, network dynamic in the platform and make it so much more fast, expedient, and agile. And maybe I can even, let's say, use my imagination to go one step further. As we are have, a, let's say, availability on the capacity we have in our factory, we can start sharing that production capacity back into the, man uh, the 3D experience marketplace to start sharing that with our value network and thus being a full collaborative part of the value network. Right? So as I as discussed earlier, one of the ways we need to achieve value in manufacturing is we need to figure out and manage the demand of our customers, our ability to supply that um, and manufacture that demand, but also looking at the continuously at a dynamic network of suppliers to configure precisely the product that we need for this specific demand. All right, clear. So, so I think here we have all the element to actually uh, be able, with the 3D experience suite, to, to manage our value network. We have uh, all the process to capture, um, to capture uh, uh, demands. Uh, we have the strategic sourcing part, which will allow us to uh, to, uh, to uh, adaptively um, map our, our, uh, our uh, supply base, okay? And, and we have the marketplace on top of that, which will provide us the ability to indeed be, be being able to provide this, this value network or manage this value network. So clear, uh, the 3D experience suite is uh, uh, a proper way or the best way to manage the value for us. We took a smart decision. We are managing value. Now there's just one thing, Garth, we need to execute, right? Yes, sir. So how do we do that? Well, to do that, we're going to combine the creative theme and the human theme. And let's go right into the 3D printing factory and take a look at that in action, where we're going to talk about driving very good and efficient execution right on the shop floor by not only triggering the execution, but monitoring the result and then optimizing the operation based on real-time information. So here, this is the factory cockpit that we're accessing through the 3D Experience platform. And this is showing us our 3D printer factory and all of the equipment that's currently in operation. And we can see the schedule of work orders happening. And uh, there you can see there's three, several, uh, three uh, similar work orders on this particular part that's uh, being batched right now. And more than just seeing the schedule, we can get the real-time information coming from the equipment. We can see that on one printer, the job is now complete. And in fact, it's in quality control to check the result. And again, because this is real time, as the quality control is happening, we now see it's changed its status, and it's now in KO. It's no longer good. And because this is all digitally connected, we can go into that information and dig in to find out what's going on and see can we resolve this right now on the fly. And thanks to the power of 3D to help us communicate, we can see the quality control person has gone in and indicated there is a problem on the top surface. We can see the notes that they've put in. We can look at maybe pictures they've taken. And clearly, this is a problem that we need to resolve. So we can send out a non-conformance notification, pause all the other similar jobs until we can resolve this, and now go about working on the resolution. And in this case, we need to do a milling operation to smooth out that surface. And we can go and schedule that in the work order. And now we can ask manufacturing engineering to go in and, and create that machining program for the mill. And because this is 3D Experience Platform, we can do this no problem. And we can leverage the real 3D geometry, the master geometry. We can set up the tooling and set up the equipment, and then go in and program virtually and validate that, that actual tooling that we want to do. And all this information can then be connected back into the 3D factory, the printing factory. It can be scheduled into rework to fix that non-conforming part. And once that's been validated, we can update the other work orders with this process so that now everything can be rescheduled real time dynamically like this. So thanks to the 3D Experience platform and the 3D Experience twin and being connected in real time, we're able to drive the operations, monitor them, mitigate the problems that we have, and optimize things on the fly so that we can make sure we have an on-time delivery with a lot of speed and agility. OK, all that from the 3D Experience platform. So it's clear. Uh, how the 3D experience uh, twin will help us execute, right? But so this is more global. This is about the, the you know the, the global organization uh, of, of production, right? But how how does the 3D experience platform will 
on the 3D experience tree will help the people on the shop floor, the men and women that are going to execute all those uh, single tasks. Okay, so let's do that. Let's go into the shop floor and we'll take a look where that everything everyone does and every business process that's being followed, the 3D Experience platform and the 3D Experience twin are going to help with automation to make things much more efficient and much more accessible and simpler for everyone to collaborate and follow up. So one of the uh, example here is of the common lean manufacturing practice, which is the five minutes meeting to kind of start the day. So here we have, uh, we can look to start our five minute meeting. We can uh, say who's here today on the team. So uh, we're all here, but let's, for an example, say, Guillaume, you're not here today. Maybe you're off or you're Done. sick or something, OK? Now, imagine now this information being collected by all the teams that are working and some automated uh, intelligence here being able to collaborate on all of this and give us information as to how might we balance some missing or unavailable uh, capacity and some skills and give us some recommendations. Now we want to go in and uh, assign people to the, where they might be working for the day. So I can put Morgan over here. I can put Rob here. Hey, I'm not here. I'll put myself here. You're not here. I can't put you here. And imagine again with the, the platform intelligence being able to not only position us here, but go and check our certifications, check that they're up to date, check that we have the skills and the competence to do the work that's being asked of us. Now, also part in our five minutes meeting, we want to go in and take a look about what our health and safety was yesterday. And yesterday, we did have a deviation, so we can report that. But the system is saying, wait a second, you had a deviation. You need to take an action. It's not acceptable to leave this deviation here. So we'll take a, a note and, and have a follow-up action on that. And finally, in the team, we're looking at our, our work orders from yesterday. And you know, we, we, we can indicate that for this metric. And if we see that there's an ongoing problem, again, we can take an action to follow that up. Now, all of this interaction that we've been doing in our five minutes meeting is being tracked. And it's available. And we can go back and see what we have done in previous days. We can close out some of the uh, tasks that are, are done. Uh, this new task in here that we want to work on today, uh, Morgan, I'll, I'll have you look into that, and we'll see what's going on. So thanks to, to all of these capabilities, you know, we're helping everyone in the factory, you know, the workers, the team leads, the supervisors, and providing amazing visibility and traceability to virtually manage everyone and uh, have a very, very efficient shop floor operation. OK, this is one instance of lean manufacturing. This is a five-minute meeting. I guess, I guess we, can do, uh, we can do other instances of lean manufacturing, right? Of course. We can imagine a scenario here where we want to do some collaborative problem solving, where we uh, maybe have a fishbone type of approach. Uh, we want to work collaboratively, do some brainstorming, uh, and again, take some ideas, create some assignments and actions and follow up. And because of digital continuity and this interface that's easy to collaborate, this is all inside the 3D Experience platform. So there are tasks and actions to follow up by people once we leave this room and go on to our day. Yeah, so it's not only the 3D experience will, will help us drive our operation uh, on a daily basis, but on top of that, it will certainly help every one of us on shop floors to manage our teams and, and for people on the shop floor to execute efficiently what they have to do. Smart decision making, management of value, providing a, a efficient execution. One last topic, okay? How is the 3D experience stream helping us innovating? This is an important topic. Well, there's two elements to your question about innovation. The first question is, how can we use the 3D Experience platform to innovate and explore these new ideas? But then, once we have the right ideas, how can the 3D Experience platform help us execute those and get those uh, completed? So to start with the very first question on innovation, let's go upstairs from the shop floor into the process and manufacturing office, where we'll see what new ideas are being worked on. So here, what you will see is some work being done, investigation to explore a new flexible MRAM cell. And MRAM is a multiple robotic advanced manufacturing cell. And with some collaboration we've been doing with Wichita State University in the United States and the National Institute of Aviation Research, we're working to develop the manufacturing cells of the future. And using the 3D Experience platform, we're able to integrate and program virtually these manufacturing uh, MRAM cells with multiple manufacturing technologies and incredible flexibility. So that one day, in the above example, you are being able to do some manufacturing on a composite fuselage. And the very next day, reconfiguring that so you can do some manufacturing, say, for a wing on a, on a drone aircraft. 
And this is the kind of thing that at Dasho Systems we are very, very excited to do by working with Wichita State University to train the next generation of engineers using real industrial projects like this so that they can build the factories of the future. Okay, so this is really about R&D. It's really about investigation of new technology to see how, uh, how that can help in building the, factor, the factory of the future or the future of industry. Uh, but uh, in a lot of cases, innovation is not that shiny side of the problem. It's the other one, the one that take an innovation and try to push it through the shop floor uh, efficiently. Can, can, can the 3D experience field yes, so help us the, doing that? This is the second part of the question about execution. And let's go back in the boardroom to do that, because a lot of times there are some decisions made in the boardroom that then need to be pushed the enterprise. So here we have everything at our disposal to do that. We've got a, a, our current excavator product that's in a max configuration. We can see that there's multiple options. There's a couple of different bucket sizes that our customers can choose from. And we can also see that the team has been exploring some new ideas that they're looking at to make a better experience for our customers to drive into some new markets. And one of the ideas that's coming out is, a, is an entirely new attachment to give a, a, a new usage of the product. So because we want to be flexible and take advantage, we have access to the digital project plan. We can see that it's still in design. So there might be a chance to actually get this to market quickly. And to do that, we simply take the task that's available, drop it to in-work, and that will assign a task to engineering to go and do an exploration on this. So because we have access to all this relevant information, we can make the right decisions, set up a plan for success, and put that plan in motion. OK, this is on the engineering side, right? So what's, what's, what's happening on the manufacturing? So the manufacturing side, let's go now back to the manufacturing office where we can see the consequences of that action coming out from the boardroom that went to engineering. Engineering did a bit of a study. And now in manufacturing, we have to see what to do and to deal with that. So here we can see that engineering has updated the model. They've added the attachment. And now on the manufacturing side, it's our job to take the process planning and incorporate that new option into our, our flexible manufacturing. So because this is all digitally connected on the platform, we can take the engineering data. We can now navigate and find the corresponding manufacturing information, connect that with the, the manufacturing process plan that we need to now revise to incorporate this new option, set that in as, an, as a task to be worked on, and now the manufacturing engineer can do their work to upgrade that process, process plan. So all this, as you can see, is very simple. It's very quick. It's completely digitally connected in real time. And this is how, with everything we've just shown, the 3D Experience platform and the 3D Experience twin are helping to improve productivity and agility for very efficient execution on the shop floor, which is the human theme, and also unleashing extreme creativity and innovation in manufacturing, which is the creative piece. Thank you very much. So I think, uh, I hope at least you, you got the picture. The 3D Experience Twin will help us make smart decision making. Um, it will help us uh, manage the value it will help us execute efficiently on our shop floors all those operations that we need to perform. And finally, it will unleash our creativity. So this is the kind of, of things we need to be able to be in the winning pack of the race to the age of experience. So this uh, concludes this uh, demo. Thank you, gentlemen. And actually, this concludes the first half of this plenary session. <laughs>